Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new edition of Tracing Text with Anton and Sylvia, coming to you live from deep in the heart of the state of Tennessee. And today we have a show that、uh, is going to be focusing on your topic, Anton. Tell us about your author and what you have titled this episode number eight. Well, this episode of、uh, Tracing Texts will be called Alvaro Cunqueiro and Sophisticated or Reconstructive Literature. Okay, excellent. So you're going to be talking about this particular author, Alvaro Cunqueiro. Tell us a little bit about his biography before we begin and delving into his work. Well, in my opinion, Alvaro Cunqueiro is one of the most important、uh, writers in Spain in the 20th century, and unfortunately, I don't think he has、uh, achieved. The amount of recognition that he deserves for several different reasons, and、uh, not that our podcast is going to make him instantly <laughs> world known and world famous, but、um, he's a writer that has always been important to me. I've read his works、uh, for a very long time,、uh, since I was a teenager or so, and、uh, I'm actually working on a project about him, and particularly about his prose,、uh, about his novels. And so、uh, that's why I chose him to、uh, showcase his work on this、uh, new edition of Tracing Texts. He、um, wrote both in Galician and in Spanish. He was from Galicia, in the northwest of Spain. He actually was born in the town of Mondoñedo in 1911, and he died in Vigo, my hometown,、okay. in 1981. Okay, how interesting. When he was just、uh, 69, actually, he wasn't really not that, that old, old. No, when he died. Uh, he often translated into Spanish、uh, some of the texts that he had originally written in Galician, and then he would also write other texts, particularly articles,、uh, journalistic art- articles in Spanish, and then、uh, a lot of his works were actually written in、uh, Galician. He was a multifaceted writer.、Uh, he wrote poetry and drama and newspaper articles.、Uh, Essays about all sorts of topics like literature, history, art, folklore, cuisine, even. <laughs>、uh, wow! Yeah. So he's a、uh, definitely very、uh, talented in in all sorts of fields. Well, he was a man that really liked to eat. That's that is for sure, <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why he enjoyed writing about food and、uh, about the Galician cuisine and. That sort of stuff.、Uh, he was also a translator, but he is best known for his narrative、uh, works and especially his novels. And we're going to be talking today about、uh, one of those novels,、um, and we will introduce that a little bit later on. So, can you tell us a little bit about his formative years, his education? Yes, he was、uh, interested in literature from a very early age. He went to college in Santiago, which is Santiago de Compostela.、Uh, Santiago de Compostela, yeah, of course.、Okay. Uh, and everyone probably <laughs> knows about Santiago de Compostela because of、uh, El Camino de Santiago, or Saint James's Way,、uh, the pilgrimage, right? Exactly. And the big, beautiful cathedral that、mm-hmm. lies there.、Um, But he really didn't care too much、uh, about his studies.、Uh, at some point, he decided to quit and、uh, become a journalist. I suppose this was at a time when a journalism degree wasn't absolutely absolutely necessary, right? To become a journalist,、um, and you know, in these early years, he also distinguished himself as a Galician nationalist. And one of the founding members of the Partido Galeguista, which、mm-hmm. is a nationalist.、Um, A party, or was a nationalist party that、uh, he was a part of、mm-hmm. uh, back in those days.、Um, however, uh, in his twenties,、uh, uh, during the Spanish Civil War, he happened to be on Franco's side for a while. Yes,、um, and after the war,、uh, during the first few years of Franco's dictatorship,、uh, starting in nineteen thirty nine, he published articles in many of uh, the. Uh, Uh, publications that were leaning towards the Francoist ideology. Right.、Um, Franco was also Galician, wasn't he? That's right. I'm. I, I don't think that would be the reason why. But、um, but he just had. He just kind of subscribed to that. Toward lean towards、uh, the Francoist ideology at the many, time. Many times during、uh, civil wars, you know, depending on where you are. At the、mm-hmm. time that it breaks、right. out, you may be caught in, in the, one、uh, faction or another, right? And that might be one of the things that、um, led him to 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 this situation. 
But, you know, he definitely took advantage of the fact that uh, Franco won the war, the nationalist side mm-hmm. won the war, and, you know, during the first few years of uh, Franco's dictatorship in the 1940s, he was collaborating with a lot of the publications that um, uh, were uh, upholding that sort of um, uh, ideology. Uh, he even moved to Madrid to work for the newspaper ABC or ABC, mm-hmm. which is one of the most important newspapers really in Spain, even right now, and a okay. uh, fairly conservative one at that. Okay. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, uh, Sylvia, in a highly politicized world uh, that we're living in right now, um, and pretty much always have throughout the right. 20th century and before, uh, all of this would earn him a great deal of criticism uh, from left-leaning writers and left-leaning critics, uh, and this may really be one of the reasons why he isn't as well-known these days as uh, he should be, or as other more left-leaning writers of the time, like Garcia Lorca, for example, Alberti, and several others, um, tend to be. So generally, writers tend to be left-leaning, and he is not so much so, so so that could have potentially been a reason. At least he wasn't uh, during a part of his life, okay. an important part in the history of Spain, too, because mm-hmm. it's the Civil War and the post-war period, the, the, the immediate post-war period. Um, However, in the, in the mid-1940s, around 1944, 1945, important time as well. Right, the, it's the, during the end the of World War, World War II. Mm-hmm. Uh, he distanced himself from the regime of Franco uh, and returned to his um, home area of Galicia, where he had been born. Uh, these were very difficult times for him because you have to think that it's not easy to distance yourself right. from the dictatorship, especially when you have been collaborating with it for a while. Right. Uh, I'm not going to go into the All reasons the political... why um, he, he, he did so, but these were very difficult times for him. I can imagine. Uh, he was stripped of his um, uh, journalism certificate for a while, which meant that he was not able to actually work. Which is interesting. He didn't have a degree in journalism, but you had to have a journalism certificate to work. Uh, actually, sort of like a license. To it's a little to... bit like a license. Yeah. The, the word in Spanish is carnet. Right? Okay. So um, it really, uh, he, he did not have a degree in journalism, but but, uh, but you had to have a, that official documentation to be able to do. Yes, that. he was. Um, he was allowed to mm-hmm. uh, uh, work as a journalist mm-hmm. uh, because he had that. Uh, certificate, which I suppose was government issued, uh, but when he distanced himself ideologically and also physically in right. many ways from the uh, dictatorship, he was stripped of that, and so for a while he wasn't able to find any work uh, as a journalist. Uh, he he would freelance for a bit, uh, and those were really uh, difficult times for him in the uh, mid to late. 1940s and early 1950s, uh, there are several letters. Uh, he, right. he was a um, uh, huge letter writer. He wrote, he, his correspondence is, is, is really enormous. Mm-hmm. And so some of the letters that he wrote, particularly to his really good friend, really close friend, Francisco Fernández del Riego, uh-huh. uh, show these difficult times for him and right. how he's always asking uh, del Riego for... Uh, the chance to publish this or that article. He talks a lot about the works in progress that he's working on and that that sort of thing. So right. those were really uh, complicated times uh, for right. for Alvaro Cunqueiro. But he eventually uh, found work with uh, several different Galician newspapers and publications, uh, some really important ones like La Voz de Galicia, which is, mm-hmm. of course, still... Uh, going strong these days, uh, La Noche, and then in the 1950s he began to work for Faro de Vigo. Now, Faro de Vigo is the uh, newspaper from my hometown, from Vigo. Okay, and it's still... And it's still uh, an important newspaper, not necessarily because it's distributed all over Spain, which, you know... It's more of a uh, regional newspaper. It is, although you can find it in other parts of Spain, but the important thing about this newspaper was that it it was founded in 1853, so it's the oldest newspaper in Spain okay. that is still open and still working. How interesting. Uh, so uh, he worked uh, for for them uh, and he actually became the director for several years in the 1960s of 
El Faro de Vigo. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that sort of helped him economically, but it also gave him an outlet for a lot of the very interesting articles that he, that he wrote. Uh, all of these, of course, or most of these, in Spanish, uh, okay. not, 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 in, Galicia. not in Galicia. Um, now, what is the most successful period uh, of, of his, his career, uh, of his literary career? Uh, no doubt between the late 1950s and the late 1970s, so almost like a 20-year span, right. um, where he devoted himself solely to writing, and he wrote uh, all sorts of works, and uh -huh. one several important literary awards like the uh, Premio Nacional de la Critica, Critica, the National Prize, in 1959, and the Premio Nadal, which was one of the most yeah, it's important, a very important uh, prize in Spain, in Spain at the time. In 1968, he, right. he, he got that one. So, you know, that's pretty much the background information that um, people out there should mm -hmm. know about this writer, uh, Álvaro Conqueiro, who, as we said at the beginning, is perhaps not as renowned or as right. recognized as, as he, he maybe should be. Right. So tell us a little bit about his work now that you've told us about his, you know, his education, his career in general. Yes, Conqueto was um, at the very beginning of his career when he began writing. Uh, he was a poet. Mm -hmm. He concentrated on poetry in the 1930s and he wrote collections that uh, could be ascribed to the avant-garde. Uh, of course, Pretty much everyone was doing that at the right. time in Spain and elsewhere. Um, and also, he followed this trend that uh, was popular in Galicia at the time, uh, which was called el neotrovadorismo, or new troubadourism. I'm not even sure if that's a... a How long did this period last? It didn't really last for a, for, for a very long time, but it was important in the resurgence of mm, literature written in, in Galicia. Like, is it folk... Folk tale related, like is it that? Does it have those sort of elements? Is that why it's called? It's more uh, related the to the uh, long-standing tradition of uh, medieval uh, cantigas right. and the old um, songs and poems written by the troubadours in the Middle right. Ages in Galicia uh, and other parts of Europe. That's why it's called neo trovadorismo, mm -hmm. like the new way of writing like the old troubadours. Okay. Uh, this is, would also be and we'll talk about this uh, maybe a little bit later, what I would call uh, sophisticated and reconstructive literature, because the idea is to reconstruct a kind of literature, to, to bring back a kind of literature from the past. And make it current? That's right, and make okay. it current, which is um, really what he does okay. in, in, in a lot of his uh, poetry and definitely in a lot of his uh, prose. So some examples of this would be uh, uh, a couple of books that he wrote, a couple of collections of poetry that he wrote in Galician in the 1930s. Uh, Mar ao Norde, mm -hmm. which is something like, uh, could be translated as Sea to the North. Right. Uh, and Cantiga Nova, que se llama Ribeira. Uh, so the new song uh, called Ribeira. Uh -huh. uh, again, Cantiga Nova, the new song, uh, harking back to... to the medieval times, right. but making it new in, exactly. in, in a way. So even though it looks like the avant-garde and the neo-trovadorismo are very different, they really spring from the same idea, the mm -hmm. idea of making something new, but in That's this right. case using the past and bringing the past to, to the present. Right. Uh, uh, he also wrote a couple of plays, um, and the most uh, famous of, uh, of them is one which is really his own take on the history of Hamlet. Oh, how interesting. Um, El incierto señor don Hamlet. Um, <laughs> the uncertain uh, Mr. Hamlet, really, or something like that. Uh, what do you think prompted him to write that play? Just well, he talks about that in some of the uh, interviews that uh -huh. he gave. Um, and some of them can actually be found on YouTube. Oh, how, okay, um, I'll have to check those out. And he talks about how he wanted to rewrite Hamlet from a different perspective. And that's another thing, again, trying to look at something from the past, trying to uh, make it current, make it different, and uh, create something different, something new from something that comes from uh, a certain tradition. In this case, uh, the theater of Shakespeare, of which... Uh, he was uh, a big um, fan. fan, and he really enjoyed the theater of Shakespeare. Uh, he also wrote 
a couple of collections of uh, what is known in Spanish as semblanzas, uh, literary portraits of real characters that he knew mm -hmm. that actually mix reality and fiction. It's not just a real portrait of a person, right. but it mixes in some So it kind of fictionalizes elements. somebody's life, some, so that they would be like people that he knows or kind of maybe prominent figures in society that day? Not necessarily prominent, just, just people, people that he, he knew from, from the... day-to-day -day uh, day ...who lived in the Galician okay. villages that, that he knew, and, you know, he, he used to like going to bars and uh -huh. taverns and just sit around, drink wine, and talk to the people, and he got a lot of information, a lot of material for And these, then he would uh, elaborate. Portraits. And then he would elaborate <laughs> and include, because basically uh, the, 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 the main thing about... Um, Cunqueiro's work is his penchant for imagination, for fiction, uh -huh. and for narrating things that are mm, strange and surprising in a way that, within the text, isn't really surprising at right. all. Does that ring a bell? Right, right? exactly. With magical realism. Exactly. Um, he was a master at, at these semblanzas or, or, or portraits. He, some of the best pages that he ever wrote are these short Semblanzas. Uh, semblanzas, yes, uh, and portraits. Um, and really, the mixture of reality and fiction, as I'm saying, uh, you know, the real world and the mythical elements is a main feature, is a main characteristic of the works of Álvaro eh, Cunqueiro. He also uh, began writing novels uh, mm -hmm. in the 1950s. So, first and foremost, he was a poet at the mm -hmm. very beginning of his career, but then in the he, 50s, he, he transitions. transitions into um, prose. prose, and there's there are several different reasons uh, for that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's remember that during Franco, uh, writing in Galician was not accepted. Right. Uh, had been banned for a while, and of so, course in the 1950s this begins to change a little bit, and Cunqueiro believed that writing prose in Galician was very important to bring the language back. Right. Remember that this nationalist Tendency. Feeling. He's always had that. Na he has Galician nationalism. Yes, uh, he he does have this this love of the Galician language, Galician culture, uh, and in in many ways he follows these um, nationalist um, ideas. Right. Uh, and he did uh, throughout his whole life, although you know they evolved over the years, of course. Um, but. He thought that writing uh, prose was very important for the Galician language, and so uh, he wrote several novels, uh, usually in Galician and then translated by himself. Into Spanish. Uh, into Spanish. Okay. Uh, some of them are Merlin y Familia. We'll talk about this one today, uh, from 1955. And then there are others like Las Crónicas del Sochantre from 1956, Las Mocedades de Ulises <laughs> from 1960, Si Obello Sinbad Volvese a Sillas, uh, If Old Sinbad Went Back to the Islands from 1961. <laughs> Then another one called Un Hombre Que Se Parecía a Orestes from 1969. That's the one that he won the Nadal Prize okay. for, uh, a man that looked like Orestes. So uh -huh. again, as you uh, can referring see... Referring back to mythology, he's referring like back to Ulysses, mythology, yes. Orestes. But not Orestes. just, not just a classical mythology, uh, but also the mythology of King Arthur and right. the Knights of the Round Table. Also um, Asian or, you know... Um, um, Oriental um, mm -hmm. mythology as well when uh, he has this novel that deals with Simbad, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, you know... Like A Thousand and One Nights. A Thousand and One Nights, and he was interested in all sorts of folk tales from all over the world, but uh, also uh, the original uh, or traditional folk tales from his um, birthplace of Galicia. Now, the epitaph uh, on his uh, gravestone reads, and this is, I think, uh, pretty uh, interesting and gives you an idea of the kind of person that Conqueda was. Uh, it reads, Here lies someone who, with his work, made Galicia last another thousand springs. Oh, so that's a pretty... It's really beautiful. Yes, right? it's beautiful. Uh, but it also means, uh, you know, that he uh, placed a lot of... Uh, importance on the works that he wrote in Galician uh, as uh, a way to, key, uh, to, to kind of uh, uphold a tradition. Keep that, it alive. Yes. Uh, that, that rebirth of, or, you know, the continuing of yes. that literature. Basically. Which is a tradition that he sensed uh, as a long-standing tradition of hundreds of years. Right. So. 
You're listening to Tracing Texts with Sylvia and Anton, and we're talking today about Álvaro Cunqueiro, the right. Galician writer uh, from the northwest of Spain. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about his uh, life, we've talked a little bit about the kinds of works that he wrote, and now we're going to concentrate on... Well, you told me that you were going to talk about sophisticated or reconstructive literature, so... I'm going to ask you why you chose that. What does it mean for our listeners? Well, um, sophisticated that. reconstructive literature comes from the, um, I guess, the critical um, world of uh, philosophical materialism as li literary criticism. Uh, right. And uh, sophisticated or reconstructive literature denotes a uh, type of literature that uses irrational elements in a rational and critical way, mm -hmm. but uh, very often also in a playful way. Okay. Um, so that uh, the writers that uh, deal in this kind of literature, uh, whether it be in prose or in verse, uh, could also be drama. You know, we're right. talking in the, in the case of of, of Cunqueiro more about his prose, more about his novels and uh, short sketches. Uh -huh. uh, the writers that deal in this kind of literature mm, take something that's irrational, like uh -huh. magic, uh -huh. like the supernatural, things that can't be explained uh, rationally necessarily. Uh, that come from myths from uh -huh. the past, from you know. Uh, traditions that go back to the beginning of time. And they bring those traditions, those myths, to, uh, to, to, to the present. You know? But they do so in a critical way, as a way as, in a rational, critical way, as a way to talk about the complexity mm -hmm. of the uh, modern world. Right. Uh, using uh, elements from times gone by. Mm -hmm. um, so, really... Uh, what what they're doing is they're bringing mythical elements from the past into the present in a critical and a rational way, and these elements are seen as normal within the fictional world of the literary work. So magic doesn't seem strange. Right, for it's example. just part of the the rationale, the the cosmovision of what the existence of that world, like you mentioned. That's right, and so. Uh, you know, this makes Cunqueiro, in my opinion, um, one of the uh, pioneers of what is known as magical realism or realismo magico in, in, Sp in Spanish. And, you know, when one thinks about magical realism, of course, we're... We're thinking of Carpentier, well, like the early ones, Carpentier, Borges, and then we have Garcia Marquez, and then some of the other boom writers like Fuentes or, you know... So we usually think very specifically of Latin American literature. Right. right? But of course, uh, this sort of um, uh, trend, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of technique does not appear in a void. Right, it's always influenced uh, or uh, informed by other writers. And in, in, in this case, uh, I think Cunqueiro is a good candidate, if, if not to be the inventor, because right. who knows, you know. Uh, who is the inventor <laughs> of magical realism or of anything, really. Right. Um, but he definitely is one of the forebears. Uh, if you read uh, his first two novels, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Merlin y Familia, mm -hmm. uh, eh, Las Crónicas del Sochantre, both of them from the mid-1950s, right. you can see these elements that would later be known as realismo magico or magical realism right. already very clearly developed in his uh, fiction. So... You know, when tracing, right. which is something we do here. In, right, in, that's in, what we're in, trying in to figure show, out right? <laughs> with uh, these when, texts. <laughs> <laughs> when tracing the, the origins of something, one has to be very careful because, right, because one may not have always read everything. Right, uh, of that author or any other author for that matter. Yeah, that's very true. So Albano Cunqueiro has uh, hardly ever been credited with, with this, but he definitely seems to be one of the uh, forebears, the pioneers of... Uh, magical realism. Um, we can see this very clearly in Merlin uh, y Familia, originally written in Galician as Merlin e Familia, right. uh, in 1955, and then translated by himself into Spanish. Uh, it was his first novel. Mm -hmm. It was written at a very prolific time in his career. Uh, as we said before, when he had mo moved back from, from Madrid to 
Galicia, back to Galicia. Uh, and was still still struggling to find uh, steady work as a journalist, but he was writing a lot mm -hmm. uh, during that time period. Fortunately, this book um, has been translated into English, not oh. by Cunqueiro. <laughs> uh, I don't know who translated it, really, because uh -huh. I don't have, the, you don't have the, the, edition. the edition in English. I okay. read it uh, both in Galician and then in Spanish. Um, but it was uh, published by Everyman's Library. Okay. Uh, and so it is translated into English as M Merlin and Company, not okay. Merlin and Family, as you because might it think. would not make sense. Uh, it would, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a, a kind of a too literal of a translation. So it was translated as uh, Merlin and Company, and uh, I just checked this yeah. morning, and it's uh, still available. For example, from Amazon. Uh, so uh, this would be a good way to, if you don't read in Spanish, if you don't read in Galician. Um, to start. actually have access to the uh, work of Alvaro Cunqueiro by reading in English. Uh, and I don't know if the translation is good or bad, I haven't uh, checked right. it, but in any case it gives you a chance to actually uh, have access to, to. his um, uh, literary universe. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a very significant work in his, in his production. Um, and and what is the the, the, the the novel about? Yeah, why does he use the image of or the figure of Merlin? Well, um Cunqueiro was really interested in the folklore of different parts of the world, but in particular uh, Galician and Celtic folklore and myths. And Galicia is very much the the myth, the mythology or the folklore is very much based on a Celtic uh like background, right? Yeah, there's a very um, strong uh, Celtic element mm -hmm. to some of the traditions and beliefs and folk tales of uh, Galicia, and perhaps because the Celts uh, are supposed to have uh, lived there. Um, there are Celtic remnants, uh, you know, Celtic music is played, some Celtic like festivals are still. Uh, celebrated over there. It's not clear mm -hmm. uh, to what extent it, the Celts really lived there, how many were there, uh, how the long influence. they lived there, and how deep their influence really is. Uh, uh -huh. But there seems to be a certain you know, Celtic influence from centuries ago. So those traces are there. They seem to be there, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, uh, sometimes I think that those traces have been exaggerated um, intensely, and sometimes with a political um, interest. <laughs> like maybe uh, a na the nationalist uh, the, element. The nationalist element, and definitely during the 19th century when, you know, uh, early 19th century, mid-19th century, when, with this romantic view of, like, of, of um, you know, the, the culture of the people uh, as, right. as something that distinguishes a certain you know, part of Spain from another part of Spain. So this, this mythical, really. Right, and it was occurring of, in other parts of Europe, like with the Grimm's, uh, comp their compilation of fairy tales, for example, and other places were doing similar. Yeah, things. if you think, for example, of the Galician anthem, there is right. such a thing as the, as the Galician anthem. It was written by Eduardo Pondal. Uh -huh. the, 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 the lyrics were written by Eduardo Pondal, who was... Uh, very important romantic right. Galician poet, poet. Uh, and of course the lyrics talk a lot about how the Galician people is um, or descends from uh, the old Celtic uh, myths of Breogang and all that sort of thing. So yes, there's there's definitely definitely that um, element, the you know that that feature there, okay. and he and the Cunqueiro was extremely interested in that. Um, and that is why he was interested in the figure of Merlin and the Knights of the Round Table. But is this a chivalric book uh, yeah. like those that, that Don Quixote yeah. liked to read so much? Not really. Not really, no. So what does it deal with? Well, the novel presents an elderly Merlin. It's not Merlin at, a, in his prime, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and he has decided to retire. Okay. And, of course, when it comes time for a wizard to retire, uh, where in the world would he, he go? Well, I think maybe uh, Spain, Galicia. Uh, exactly. So he decides to retire uh, in a place called Miranda in the mountains of Galicia. Okay. And, of course, 
you know, there's there's a similarity in the um, in the landscape of you know some parts of Galicia and you know some parts of Brittany and France and of course Wales and 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 Scotland and and Ireland and uh, and the Isle of Man and you know all, all those, those supposed Celtic nations, you know. So yes, I mean, of course. If you have been a wizard all your really long life and you've done uh, all those deeds that, that Merlin did, big, um, you would like to retire in a place that is sort of recognizable to you, but that is also um, sort of mm, quiet and calm and a place where you can actually just sit back and relax. And okay. so he decides, Merlin decides <laughs> to retire in Galicia. Uh, and, uh, of course... He only works occasionally because uh, he's retired, right? Yeah, he now, when I'm have, retired, I don't want to work too work, much. Me right? neither. <laughs> uh, so he only works occasionally when some kind of uh, interesting character drops by for some sort of social call. He just pops around for a visit. You know? Okay. Or to ask for Merlin's help. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's not just a visit to, to chat of with him. Of course, they want something. They need something they from need him. Something. <laughs> his, his fame has preceded him, and so they know where he's at. I'm not sure why, but they, they follow him. They find to, him. <laughs> to the mountains of Galicia and find him, and you know that is the beginning of um, a certain story. So um, that's basically what the novel is about. But the interesting thing is we don't have this omniscient narrator we don't have even Merlin as a first-person narrator telling this story. But what we have is uh, Felipe uh, mm -hmm. as the narrator. And Felipe is one of Merlin's servants in Galicia. Okay. okay? <laughs> Who, as an older man, remembers his time working in Galicia for Merlin and reflects on some of the things that he saw back then. Okay. So, uh, basically, when Merlin retires to Galicia, to the mountains of Galicia, he, of course, needs some help. And one of his servants uh, was Felipe. Uh -huh. So, later on, as an old man, Felipe sits down and either writes or, you know, remembers... Uh, all of these stories uh, that happened mm -hmm. while he was in Merlin's service when Merlin was in Galicia uh, in retirement. So, in this sense, uh, what we have here is a sort of memoir. Okay. Uh, and Felipe is looking back in time and he's offering his recollections of things past. Okay. Which, you know, <laughs> which we're, uh, you said, we're trying to reconstruct the past that's right. for the present. But he is actually remembering the past, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, bringing that past into the present. Because this is not Merlin no. as part of the Arthurian cycle. No, it's just... Uh, it's just Merlin in retirement... And he in just Galicia. happens, it's kind of like a way of, of bringing it all back. That's uh, right. An excuse to tell the story. What it is, is it's really an excuse. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely <laughs> it's right. It's an excuse to tell the story. <laughs> so throughout the book, because of this setting, uh -huh. right, uh, action takes a backseat mm -hmm. to storytelling. And storytelling is very important in the works of uh, Kunkedo. It always was. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that you read by Kunkedo, whether it's his uh, articles uh, or his plays, even mm -hmm. or his novels, you know, storytelling, la fabulación, mm -hmm. right, is what's going to be uh, most important. So most of the time, it isn't Felipe telling the stories. Mm -hmm. There is a polyphony of voices, so many different voices. Um, tell the stories. So the stories are told by some of these visitors okay. that um, come to ask for Merlin's help or just to visit him, uh, by some of the people who work for Merlin with Felipe, uh, sometimes by Merlin himself. Mm -hmm. um, so there are stories within stories, within stories, you know, so this makes the um, narrative structure a lot more complex and of course it brings us back to the um, idea of Cervantes' Don Quixote, when we have stories within stories and different narrators and that sort of thing. So right. this makes the novel uh, a lot more interesting than just a uh, straight-ahead um, telling of this or that story about Merlin, right. uh, which is one, I think, 
of the uh, things that Cunqueiro did very well uh-huh. in this particular uh, novel and in many others that uh, he uh, wrote later. Um, the character of, of Merlin is really not as important as the stories that he and these characters tell. It's sort of like uh, 1001 Nights because you have like the main characters, but really it's the st- each story. It's kind of a, a grouping of all these tales put together. So in some ways it's similar, isn't that's it? A good, that's really a good point. And um, Cunqueiro, if you read his uh, articles, uh-huh. you know, and there are many that have been collected and published uh, in book form, even uh-huh. while he was still alive. Right. Uh, some of them um, uh, are actually incredibly entertaining uh-huh. and very funny. Uh, but one thing that is clear is that Cunqueiro... Uh, by reading these articles, we can see that he really knew a lot about world literature. Right. His literature of all parts of the world. He uh, he had a lot of time. To read and to really, like, he knows his stuff. He really could di- dig deep. To yes. Get, to really get his material. And he could be talking yeah. about, you know, German literature. He translated Hölderlin, for example, okay, so. uh, into Galician. Right. Uh, or he could be talking about uh, Asian literature, or he could be talking about medieval literature, but he always uh, speaks in such a way that it's clear that he knows what he's talking about. Right. So he has a, uh, a very clear, very deep command right. of you know literary history. He has read a lot. He has read more than I think probably you and I put together <laughs> would Twice read it th- throughout our whole lives. Yes. Yeah, that's Twice right. Over. I mean, I know you read a lot, but... <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I'm a slow reader, but... <laughs> so, uh, you know, the narrator does not really offer too many detailed descriptions of Merlin, and he prefers mm-hmm. to concentrate on the tales. Right. Uh, and many of those tales uh, bring old myths that mm-hmm. Cunqueiro had researched into the modern age, because remember, Merlin is now retired now I find in the hills, in the mountains <laughs> of, of Galicia. Galicia. Now I want to find out if he has any like folk tales. Remember, I told him I just a little side note about mermaids <laughs> in uh, Celtic. Well, you know, you know and uh, now I'm going to have to read all his stuff. I remember that uh, you had asked me uh, yeah. several times about: Is there any collection of Galician folk tales that deal with mermaids? Uh, and I've, I, I did some research and I talked to some friends uh, who, who know about this kind of stuff more than I do. And apparently there's not really a collection of, of, of stories about that. But uh, one of the books that, and I can't remember the title right now, but Cunqueiro uh, wrote a book uh, that deals with stories uh-huh. uh, and tales related to the sea. Yeah, I'll have to check that out So now. it's possible see, that's that made in me there think of it. you may see some... Uh, mermaids or yeah. uh, sirenas, no, well, some kind. S- well, like in Celtic lore, there's selkies. So, yeah. Okay, cool. That, that would be something uh, that, that he really would be interested uh, in. Interested in and, and I think you would probably find a conversation with him uh, fairly interesting yeah. since you are so much into folk <laughs> traditions and right. folk literature. You're listening to a new episode of Tracing Text with Sylvia and Anton, and we're happy to be here uh, for the eighth time. This is our I know. eighth episode, and we're talking about the work of Galician slash Spanish author Álvaro Cunqueiro, who was born in 1911 and passed away in 1981. Okay, and to get back on track, um, let's continue on with, you know, you were talking about Medlini and y Familia, or Merlin and Company and uh, all the tales that he incorporated, so... Yes, and Merlin and Company, as you said before, is a good translation because it doesn't. the book doesn't really talk about the family of Merlin. Right. But it talks about the people that uh, kind of gravitated toward right. uh, Merlin in his old age, in this case. So mm-hmm. you're not really going to find King Arthur, necessarily, in this book. <laughs> but what you will find uh, will be stories that are based on um, oral traditions right. and oral tales that uh, um, Cunqueiro was, was really uh, interested in. Um, this is really a time in the career of Álvaro Cunqueiro, the 1950s, mm-hmm. uh, when he really takes advantage uh, of his belief in the Celtic past of the Galician people, an idea that 
is itself a myth, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, when when we try to trace our race, so to speak, or right. our um, Genetic. culture genetically back to you know uh, times long past that were supposedly like heroic and you know yeah, pre, yeah pre-Roman, pre-Roman, pre-Greek, you know, uh-huh. uh, this is always problematic because uh-huh. you can actually smell the fiction there most of the time. <laughs> Um, so sometimes it's it's done uh, with um, a polit- political intention. Sometimes right. maybe with an economic intention. Uh-huh. But in 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 this case, uh, you know, throughout the first several decades of his life, uh, Cunqueiro really believed this, mm-hmm. and that's why he was interested in the neo trovadorismo, you mm-hmm. know, the old medieval uh, songs and, mm-hmm. and poems from the troubadours. Um, and that's why he was interested in these um, uh, folk tales. Um, now, I have a couple of um, mm, quotations here mm-hmm. from um, Alvaro Cunqueiro himself, uh, because he gave lots of interviews throughout his life. Uh, as I said, some of them are available on YouTube, uh, you know, both interviews for television mm-hmm. and also for different newspapers and publications. Uh, he basically was, his life was basically all about literature. That's all he did. Mm-hmm. And that's what he liked doing the most. Um, but once he was asked about the um, inspiration for Merlin and Familia, mm-hmm. for Merlin and Company, and uh, this is what he responded. He said, I think that a great part of it comes from my childhood and my roots, from the things I heard as a child. From my country. When he says from my country, right, of he course, means he means Galicia, the northwestern region in Spain, on, to the north of Portugal. Uh, from my surrounding area, he says. From my distorting memory. And memory right. is important in, right. in his, in his uh, fiction, and particularly in, in, in Merlin and Company. From my liking of wonders and miracles. That's the reconstructive side right. of, of it. From my love of the things that don't belong to reality, but to dreams. So mm-hmm. here we are already treading into the uh, realm of magic and right. dreams and things that are not rational, mm-hmm. which he was really interested in, but he treated them in a very uh, rational way mm-hmm. uh, when all was said and done. So right. uh, there must also be some influence, I suppose, from certain things I read in my childhood and my youth and from the folk poetry I heard as a child from the people from my region, meaning mm-hmm. Galicia, uh, again. So he is very clear about where he drew a lot of the inspiration from for this uh, book, for, uh-huh. from his first novel, which was uh, quite successful at the time, I must, I must add. Right. Uh, even though now it may not be as well-known and it may be, no, I wouldn't say forgotten, but mm-hmm. um, you know, it's not the most popular or best-known novel uh, of the Spanish 20th century by any means. Now, this uh, this uh, interview uh, comes from a book of interviews uh, with Alvaro Cunqueiro that was published in 1994, mm-hmm. and that was edited by, actually, a friend of my dad's, oh, wow. uh, Ramon Nicolás, who does a lot of uh, research okay. into um, Galician literature and, and of different kinds. Okay. Uh, and I really recommend it. It's actually written in Galician, but a lot of the interviews are transcribed in Spanish okay. simply because they were they come from publications that were originally written in Spanish, okay. newspapers, and journals, magazines, stuff like that. Uh, so it's clear mm-hmm. when he's writing this book that he is really buying into these uh, myths, into this mythical idea of Galician as a Celtic uh, people, uh-huh. which is something that still uh, yeah, I mean, uh, survives these days. Right. I uh, think, for example, the, the, the soccer team in Vigo is it's called, called Celta de Vigo. Right. right. Celta de Vigo. So uh, that already <laughs> or still points towards this mythical, probably non-existent, at least not in full, right. uh, mythic Celtic past. Right. Right. Uh, so it was. He was really buying into this at, at, at this time in in his career in the nineteen fifties, and he actually wrote some really good novels based on these ideas. Right, but what happens then? Does he become disenchanted with this notion that there is this strong Celtic past, or? Well, not necessarily. I just um, it's think not. that he 
you know, his 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 readings into the history of literature and the history of mythology and that sort of thing, history in general too, right. um, must have must have deepened. Uh huh. You know, um, in the sixties and seventies, and he not necessarily that he totally changed his view, but his view did evolve. It did change right. uh, somewhat. Uh, so later in his life, uh, and I'm talking now about the 70s, maybe right. 15, 20 years later, uh-huh. um, he began to abandon this belief in the Celtic past of Galicia, and he began to diminish uh, its importance in some of the interviews that he, that mm-hmm. he gave at the time. So this is where my uh, next um, quote mm-hmm. comes from, also from the same book of interviews with Alvaro Cunqueiro. Uh, and he said, um, about two decades later, uh, there is nothing left here, meaning in Galicia, of the mythology of other Celtic regions. Now, when he says nothing, he's probably exaggerating. Right. He so went he's, from he, one extreme, he's going to, from one extreme to the next. Yes, now. because That's we know there are some Celtic mounds, <laughs> like the dolmens in the Galicia area. Yeah, they, they have I mean, certain, uh, there are certain remnants of right, the so old villages that the, the Celts yeah. uh, seem to have. Celts of you know, not clear where they were coming from or anything, but, but, they're but the they, remnants but they're are still there. there. That yeah. is for sure. So this idea of uh, there's nothing left here of the mythology <laughs> of other Celtic regions. This is very human, really, if you think right. about it. You know, people m- move from from one uh, opposite, from one uh, end of the spectrum to the opposite end of the right. spectrum, or uh, sometimes very easily. Right. Um, it's a little bit exaggerated when he says this. And then he says, the number of Celts that once lived in Galicia was negligible. Uh-huh. I think Celticism, el Celtismo, is more a literary phenomenon than anything else. And Galicians liked to belong to that wandering and mysterious <laughs> race. Um, so this idea that, that, that the identity of the group is based on a certain like. Right, they I, just like, simply... I like the I, Celts, I want to be a Celt. <laughs> you know, whether I am or not doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. But that's what they kind of idealize to a certain extent, like as their or, uh, their myth that provides like an origin myth, basically. Yeah, that's right. So in many ways, uh, wouldn't you say that in in the 15 to 20 years in between uh-huh. one quotation and the other, wouldn't you say that uh, he's taken a much more rational approach? He has. Right? What I find interesting, like not to digress too much, but um, I see that there are certain like parallels in his life where he goes from not he wasn't as extreme in his politics, but he does go from right to left. He does like when he has this like belief in the the Celtic past. It's almost like a supernatural or religious belief that then he he stops believing and he takes a very rational approach. So it's interesting. There are these parallels of going from you know w- one side of the spectrum to the other. So you know maybe you could. Talk a little bit about that, too. Well, uh, you know, the interesting thing about uh, Cunqueiro is that, you know, he had some very progressive sides to Mm -hmm. some of what he did and some of what he thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were also some conservative sides to Mm -hmm. it, which is, I think, absolutely normal. Right. Nobody's totally liberal or, 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 you know, totally uh, conservative. But... In his case, a lot of his beliefs were shaped by this nationalist feeling right. about the value of Galician culture and the value of the Galician language and how he was one of the uh, writers carrying the torch right. of Galician literature. He was very conscious about that, and it was something that was very important for him. Mm-hmm. And I think um, that really helped shape a lot of um, his literary creation, mm-hmm. uh, as well, of course, as the myths that um, he was so uh, interested mm-hmm. in, and that really shaped a whole lot of his um, works uh-huh. uh, throughout throughout the decades. That's something you know. This this magical realism, this this mythical um, view, this myth- mythical stance is something that does not quite disappear from 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 his from his works you know right. neither the there. novels nor the short stories okay like the framework of that of his work yes. it still has those mythical elements yeah in fact you know um in my um upper division literature classes when i'm when i teach uh, a um 
a survey of Spanish literature. You know, I like to include a couple of texts by Alvaro Conquero because he's just so different and he's right. just so funny. And what he writes is really valuable, I think. It's very imaginative. It's very witty. Um, and, for example, you know, one of the uh, uh, texts that I use uh, is called El Paraguas Jacinto. Uh-huh. And it's uh, the story about um, a uh, man, Jacinto, who was eaten by uh, an umbrella. <laughs> uh, and the, all of a sudden the umbrella can talk. Uh-huh. And it can stick his tongue. Uh, I would say is no. In this his in this case it would be its right. It's stick tongue, its tongue, tongue out. Um, and 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 so you know this is seen in in the work as something absolutely normal. Right. Um, somebody finds this this uh, umbrella uh-huh. and shows it to Jacinto's wife, and as soon as the umbrella sticks its uh, sticks it's, its, tongue. its tongue out. The wife says, oh, yes, that's my husband. <laughs> and actually sleeps with, with, the, a, with a, the umbrella, <laughs> yes. So uh, for her and for the characters so around, this is just he, a normal thing. So it's almost like a, a, he transfigures or changes into, shape shifts to some degree into an umbrella, even though he's like consumed by the umbrella, becomes the umbrella then? Yes, and it's, it's just <laughs> not uh, seen as something strange, just like in some of Kafka's work. Right. Uh, the fact that somebody be- turns into a bug well, that's is, okay. is not seen as something <laughs> yeah. strange, right? No. This is where this idea of magical realism comes right. comes from, and 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 that's what he does. This is why uh, Alvaro Cunqueiro's literature is sophisticated or reconstructive literature, because what it's doing is it's taking all of these you know magical, supernatural elements hard to explain and just showing them, bringing them to the present. Bringing them to to as the modern their, world as though they're facts, as, as they were something normal. Yeah, you know, like just, if I'm drinking this 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 bottle of water, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, I can fly, and that would be a normal thing. You yeah, know? of course, it's not going to happen, but, <laughs> but within in the his, fictional within world, within his fictional world, it does. It, it does, and it's absolutely normal, right? You're listening to a new episode of Tracing Text with Sylvia and Anton, live from. Uh, deep in the heart of the state of Tennessee, where you, you like that part. I do, part of and it, I don't just think I do because I, you know, it reminds me. It reminds you of deep in the heart of Texas. Yes, and I know <laughs> which that's is why where you, you're from. I know, and that's why it makes me laugh every time. <laughs> we're talking today about um, Alvaro Conquero, and we're having a great time, uh, just like I do every time I read something by or about uh, Alvaro uh, Conquero, and we're just uh, about getting ready to wind down here uh-huh. and uh, finish our episode of Tracing Texts. Um, and really, uh, I encourage everyone out there to uh, look this book up, Merlin and Company, mm-hmm. uh, Merlin y Familia, or in English, Merlin e Familia. Um, and really, you know, give it a chance and, and read it because it, it really is not just uh, fun, which it is, but it really makes you think about things in a different way, mm-hmm. from a different perspective, because that's what uh, Kunkato always does in his mm, prose, uh, in his novels or stories, or also in his really interesting newspaper articles. Yes. So uh, hopefully our listeners out there will take this recommendation and learn a little bit more about Kunkato. Yes, and really, uh, to, to, to end the episode, I would like to... Uh, point out or to underscore the fact that the important thing about Merlin and company is not really whether there was a Celtic past in Galicia or not, but the literary use of that tradition that Cunqueiro makes Mm -hmm. in works such as, you know, Merlin and company or Las Crónicas del uh, Sochantre. That's basically what he's saying in that quote. He's saying it's more a literary phenomenon right. than anything else. And I agree. That's It, it is important. If we're using that tradition, whether... Whether it, it's real or it's not, real or it's not. become real in a sense because that is the current reality. It has become very material, much, yes. Right. Through, it, 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 through it is the materialized use of through the all usage. these literary... Uh, you know, by going back into the literature or the tradition. Absolutely. absolutely. And fiction and magic uh, and storytelling were of paramount importance to Álvaro Cunqueiro at a time, uh, you know, the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, when most novels written in Spain 
concentrated on social or political issues in, 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 in sort of a roundabout way to avoid censorship. You know, censorship. And some of them are, during that period, are quite dry, I think. <laughs> so I, now I, I have I, to read Kunkade. I tend to agree uh, <laughs> Because they have that. That, that political or social, and you know there's, they're being censored, so... Yeah, and sometimes there's <laughs> ominous yeah, feel there's to a lot, them, right? Yes, they feel very heavy during uh, this period. That's true, and that kind of contrasts a little right. bit with some of what Kunkato was uh-huh. doing. I mean, it definitely contrasts with uh, what Kunkato was doing and also with what the boom writers right. would start doing in the uh, mid to late uh, 1960s. Uh, Kunkato was really following a totally different pathway, and he was creating works of what I call and what uh, some critics have called sophisticated or reconstructive literature that I think should be acknowledged as the uh, forebears of magical realism. When you think about magical realism, you can't just think about, you know, the Latin American writers of the boom or Borges or even Kafka, right, Mm -hmm. or some other uh, writers of the period, but you have to think that there was somebody... Uh, in the northwest of Spain, <laughs> who also was in the nineteen fifties, was contributing to this uh, trend and to right. this technique and to this right. you know literary element, and that someone was Alvaro Conquero, and I think uh, Merlin e Familia or Merlin and Company is the perfect example, and that's why I think it's great uh-huh. that the novel has been translated into English, so that you know uh, everyone in the English speaking world can just no. open that book and read it and. Um, understand what this is about and pretty much widen their uh, understanding of what magical realism uh, is or what we could call sophisticated reconstructive literature, Sylvia. Excellent. I think it's been fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it. Well, you know, um, my father, um, who, you know, uh, was a high school teacher, he's now retired, um, and he has also written a sizable amount of children's books and uh-huh. also books of poetry for adults. And um, he actually got the chance in the 1970s to meet Alvaro Conquero oh. one afternoon. And he always speaks very fondly um, of that uh, occasion. Uh-huh. I, I wish I had had the chance uh-huh. uh, to meet him as well. He definitely uh, sounds and reads and even on TV looks like a very interesting, uh, fascinating personality. So mm-hmm. he is definitely one of my favorite writers uh, in Spain or in any place in the 20th mm-hmm. century. And I, I, I strongly uh, recommend his work in English or Spanish or Galician or any other language into which um, his works have been translated, which there are several of. I think Mm -hmm. some of them have been translated to French, Uh Italian, German. So Now, Sylvia, what uh, are you uh, thinking of uh, presenting on the next time we meet for a recording? Well, you know my favorite theme. You know what no, wait a second. Is it, 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 <laughs> it? It's definitely not deep in the heart of Texas. Well, uh, do you like Texas? Of I course. do. I love Texas. Uh, but I would have to say that uh, it probably is either feminism or uh, the femme fatale yes. or a mixture of both. A, bo- a mixture of Good. both. But this time, instead of a, a Mexican writer, I am actually going to be presenting about a Spanish writer, and actually, she's a Catalan writer. So oh. it's not going to be the northwestern part of Spain. But the northeastern part. So it went of across Spain. the whole country. Yes. Right. It doesn't take that long, really. No, it doesn't. Once I haven't been it. to the northwestern probably part, but I should. Probably takes longer to cross soon. Texas than I it does to probably. cross Spain. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so there are also fan fatales in Spain. Now, when I lived there, I didn't see any. Oh. <laughs> well, in my novels, there. Are... But in the novels, there well, this are. one yeah. is going to be more like a novella. Okay. It's not. Uh, a, it's more than a short story. It's longer than that, but it's. Um, but it's not a full-length novel, and I'm going to be focusing on Ana Maria Moish and her work called Las Virtudes Peligrosas. So the dangerous virtues. Yes. Oh, that sounds very, you know, fan <laughs> fatale like right? Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'll be talking about that, and hopefully you'll join us for our next podcast, number nine. We'll, we'll I... have to celebrate when we have our tent. That's true, yeah. We'll have to go know. elsewhere so we can have, like, some <laughs> champagne. <laughs> yeah, sure. We're... 
<laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe we could we could record it at a bar. I know we'll have to do something. But like that. But we should do the recording before we drink, break out the champagne. True. Well, <laughs> or maybe not. Or maybe not. It doesn't matter. But you know, the the the, the show might be even better. I if, know. If we we, it might be a, an experiment that may lead to a more productive session. <laughs> drink responsibly, though, everyone out there who's listening. Okay. Uh, now the podcast. Uh, uh, will be available as usual on Podomatic. iTunes, which you can download and you can subscribe to our podcast. It's also going to be available through YouTube because you upload it through YouTube as well. Yeah, it's fairly easy to do and I think it probably widens the uh, audience of right. the, um, of the uh, uh, podcast. So it will be available on Podomatic, iTunes, and YouTube, but uh, also we have ways of getting in touch with uh, Sylvia and myself, Anton. So, uh, so what are those? So you Sylvia? can email us at tracing text, which is T R A C I N G T E X T S at gmail dot com. We welcome any comments or suggestions. We also welcome any comments or suggestions on iTunes as well, whether they're positive or negative or just constructive criticism. We welcome that as well. It would really help our podcast. Good. Uh, also, if you want some sophisticated or reconstructive criticism, that would be fine too. Yes, that would be great. So do get in touch with us and let us know how we're doing. Okay, well, that's all from us uh, for now. This has been a new episode of Tracing Text with... Sylvia. And Anton. And we come to you live from... The heart of Tennessee. <laughs> that's right. Signing off now. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month. Goodbye.